final session for the day before the drinks, let me invite the panel up um, so we can get going pretty quickly about decarbonisation. It's at the heart of so much of what is being discussed in the Blue Zone, we assume, even with a lot of differences. Um, and uh, we want to talk about um, how you finance and innovate in industry decarbonisation. Uh, and that's going to be at the heart of what I want to um, ask. No, I think you're taking my seat. You need to come to this end. I'm going to go to this end this time for a bit of variety. And I'd like to involve you as well, again, this time as well. So um, I will introduce each of them uh, as I, I ask them the question. But the, the, first, the first issue I really want to raise is how much is being decarbonized in the companies or the institutions they work for. And Jose de la Logia, who's um, president commercial, it's a long title, this. HVAC for EMEA, for Train Technologies. You're based in Belgium. Um, what do you do and how much are you decarbonizing, do you believe? Okay. So I work for a company called Train Technologies, and we are a HVAC company. So we produce equipment that makes hot and cold water and... Uh, what we, we have what we call the gigaton challenge in our company, which is we plan that by 2030 we want to reduce the uh, carbon footprint of our customers by one uh, billion metric tons, and we met one gigaton. So we are measuring this. Uh, so every time we sell a new piece of equipment, we measure what the equipment, how much less it. Uh, carbon it emits relative to what we're replacing. So we do this for our customers, but we're also doing it internally. So within our own operations, we're decarbonizing our own operations by employing some of these technologies, by also improving the uh, sustainability of our operations by, for example, installing photovoltaics, those sorts of things. So we, we feel we're contributing quite a lot to the decarbonization effort. And one of the key technologies that we're trying to advance is the reduction of waste heat. So if we think about the cooling and heating industry, this is an industry that has existed in silos for many, many years, meaning that cooling is seen as a separate entity to heating, and we, we reject heat whilst in parallel heat is being produced. And what we're trying to do is combine heating and cooling into one entity. And by doing that, you can really increase the efficiency of systems by up to 400% and, and then drive a really big step change in, the, uh, in carbon emissions. This is going to be a question for all of you. Do you think most of your customers and clients actually fully understand what decarbonization means and are accurate in what they assess their decarbonizing is and what it's achieving? I think uh, customers that buy from us, you know, they buy for many reasons, but two of the re I would say the top two reasons they buy is first of all to save energy because saving energy has a financial impact which helps pay for the project. And the second element would be around their own sustainability goals. And in that regard, they need some help in understanding how they could improve their processes to reach these sustainability goals. Do they believe always that they're decarbonizing more than they really are? Well, we can show them what they're decarbonizing in terms of the, the solutions that we sell them. And in fact, our company is one of the first companies that uh, was you know, accredited by the science-based target initiative where what we, our measurements are, um, uh, let's say, they're, they're part of this science-based target initiative, so we can help them in these type of things as well. All right. Lewis, let me come to you at the other end. Uh, Lewis McDonald, partner, global co-head of energy at the big uh, legal firm, Herbert Smith uh, Freehills. Who do you work with and what kind of view are you taking about whether decarbonizing is really working? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Nick. Um, so we work with most of the major uh, energy companies in the world. We work with most of the major mining companies as well. Um, we work for the Japanese trading houses, the, the Chinese state, the Korean trading houses, etc. Uh, we also work for private funds. So we're working for a lot of the companies that, if you like, are contributing both to the problem here, but also the solution. Um, our clients are very much on a decarbonisation journey. Um, in some cases, they are providing directly the renewable energy 
that is, um, that is more and more prevalent as the years go by. Uh, and also they're the ones that are trying to decarbonise their own businesses by employing carbon capture and hydrogen and those sorts of technologies. Are so. they really committed? Do they really get it, what they've got to do and how big the decarbonising has to, to be? Yeah, look, I think so. Um, they, in most cases, they would have a net zero 2050 plan. In most cases, they would have interim targets. Uh, and they are genuinely trying to reduce the emissions from their businesses over time. You know, the scope one emissions, so the emissions from their own activities. Scope two, you know, those they, uh, the services they bring in from the outside. And ultimately, scope three. So they, they all have plans for these uh, reductions and they're all you know, working towards those plans. Is your job to tell them these plans are going to work or they're over-optimistic, maybe over-pessimistic? Um, well, as a law firm, our, plan, our main job is to help them to understand what it is they need to do in the first place, but also to try to anticipate what is coming at them. You know, this inevitable policy response, if you like, that's out there in terms of where the world's going with uh, the regulations but also what does best practice look like? So we're trying to help them. That's a slightly extended job that would traditionally be the domain of a law firm in that generally our job would be to tell them what they need to do, what they must do to comply with the law. But our job for many years now has gone well beyond that and is trying to help them um, implement these very best practices that are available. How many of them listen to you comfortably and how, how many actually say, I can't believe I'm being asked to do this? Now, I think we've moved on from that disbelief phase. Um, in most cases now, they've been on the journey for a long time. You know, if you think about the um, acronym ESG, for example, that's really come out of um, the mining industry and the overseas operations of mining companies. As they have tried to, if you like, put in place global best practices, they, they have been looking at these concerns for, for many, many years. And to some extent, it's been adopted by the banking industry through things like the equator principles, which is where when lending to operations overseas in countries with less developed environmental laws, the best practice environmental laws are applied in those overseas countries. So they're not shocked at all. In fact, in many cases, they've been leading this journey, if you like, into the ESG practices, but also now in relation to decarbonisation. Thanks, Lewis. I'm going to come to Rob next. Alex, if you can stand by, because we heard from your president earlier, so uh, we need to just get other views at the moment. Uh, Rob LeCount, who is regional service leader on climate change for ERM. Just remind us what ERM does. You come from Washington. What is your view about where decarbonisation is really going? It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Yes, Rob LeCount with ERM, and we are the largest pure play sustainability consulting firm, so covering all aspects of sustainability and really covering all sectors. So a global firm uh, working with all aspects of, of the economy. Um, our focus is also in a deep area within climate change, and as you said, I focus within uh, the North American market. And in terms of decarbonization, we see significant uh, steps forward in terms of awareness and in terms of uh, a commitment to action. But that being said, at the same time, it is still not at pace. It is not at the pace of change that is required for the task ahead of us. What is the reception? What kind of reception do you get from your customers, your clients? I'm asking the same question as I put to Lewis. In other words, is there a kind of acceptance now, unlike four or five years ago, that this is now central to the way they're going to run their company? The clients we're working with are dedicated to decarbonization. The challenge is working with them to come up with the strategies to support that. We'll talk about some opportunities today that are very uh, available uh, today and, and looking to address those opportunities. And then there are other areas where there is still a lot of friction and a lot of development on technology. And the question becomes, what's, that, what's the, the progress and the steps to, to make that achievable? And that's what we're working with the clients on. So are you having to upskill them or encourage them to upskill themselves? It's a great question. It is uh, a critical issue. And in organizations that we have worked with, I can think of a few examples where we've worked with organizations to do a significant amount of analysis, to work with them to develop uh, the cases I'm thinking about, net zero goals, and, and to begin to implement that roadmap. That process, though, of setting that strategy at a higher level 
is very different than operationalizing that strategy. So really thinking about what that means for, from a governance perspective, to make sure that you have the incentives lined up, and then to have the incentives lined up, not just from uh, the corporate structure, but into the business units. That you have that aligned with the kind of data to support it, that is a key area. There are, uh, we see advances there, but really integrating it into the organization is the real opportunity and, and the challenge to take that forward. So, uh, Alexandra Maria Boschet, um, State Advisor on Climate and Sustainability to the President of Romania. We had the President here uh, speaking for 10 minutes before lunch. Uh, add some weight and some detail to the kind of things he was saying. After all, you still have a significant amount of old industry in, in your country, which has to be changed and has to be decarbonized. Yes. Um, so as the president was mentioning early on, in the last three decades, Romania reduced its emissions with about two thirds. And we have recently approved also our long-term strategy and we are aiming by uh, 2030 to reduce our emissions with 80% in relation to 1990. Now, you pointed well um, the fact that Romania historically and uh, has been a country with heavy polluting industry, but that has changed starting with um, the 90s. Um, we have reduced our emissions in the industry sector with about 70%. By 2030, we aim to reach 77%. And by 2050, 90%. We are, however, aware um, that you know when we are talking about emissions and net emissions, we also, in order to reach carbon neutrality by 2050, we will rely on newer technologies. So our long-term strategy also includes provisions regarding carbon capture, utilization, and storage to be able to uh, to reach uh, net zero. Um, and of course, you know, we are facing different challenges in different sectors. Uh, at the national level, the cement and the steel sector, we find those as being sectors that are uh, more difficult to, uh, to decarbonize. Um, at the national level, looking at the spectrum of emissions, transport is a sector that actually has seen growing emissions in the last three decades. So as I mentioned, overall, we reduced our emissions with two thirds, but we have seen an increase um, of emissions in the, in the transport sector. And another area that we find quite challenging is the heating and cooling. And that's not necessarily um, only from the perspective of technology available, but also because it might trigger uh, different social issues. We still have, we are a country of the European Union, Romania. Well, let, let, let me press you on that because Please. that is a significant exactly. slowing, slowing factor in all of this. The, the social implications mm -hmm. of decarbonization and the impact on, on enterprises. How are you balancing that politically within the country? So, when we talk about you know the social the social impact, we have done some analysis, and of course we are looking also at the fluctuations of the price of carbon. Again, Romania it's an EU country, so we are covered by the EU ETS, and as you know, the EU ETS will be extended also to heating, cooling, and transport areas that were only aviation was part of the ETS until now. So we found vulnerabilities at two levels. Uh, so first of all, at the citizen level when it comes you know, to heating and cooling of, of uh, buildings. And also, in particular, we found that small enterprises are particularly vulnerable. And in this regard, we you know, are starting also to come up with the solutions. We are working right now at a very special um, social climate plan, uh, basically a plan that will include a set of measures uh, in particular to help vulnerable uh, businesses to adapt in the fluctuation of the price of carbon and also those that have less means, um, our citizens that have less means actually, uh, will be giving incentives to make investments in the heating and cooling of their homes. And this plan, um, of course, will also have allocated funding and part of the funding is coming from the European Union, who actually is devoting a set of funding um, from 2026 to 2032, um, a special social climate fund. And in the case of Rum Romania, that will be around 6 billion euros. And we are also hoping to attract, 
to attract additional funding from other sources so that our you know, plan, our social climate plan would be somewhere around uh, 10 billion in investments. All right, Alex, for the moment, thank you. Jose, let me move into some of the detail now. I was intrigued by something which came out in our pre-discussion mm -hmm. and the briefing about heating and cooling exists in silos. Yes. Now, what do you mean by that? Yes, yeah, so I'll start maybe uh, there were some great comments made here, but I'll talk about a, an industrial example. So something that we can all sort of relate to. For example, the production of milk. Okay, in, during the production of milk, there's a, there's a pasteurization process, and you need to do a lot of heating and a lot of cooling at the same time. And what a lot of people don't realize is that we have technologies today that, if we can scale them, we can really dramatically reduce the carbon footprint of these heating and cooling plants. So what would traditionally happen in a milk factory, and I've been to many of them, is that they buy chillers, which are a machine that makes cold water, which is used for part of this pasteurization process, because they need to cool this milk. And then they need to, re they need to heat the milk to, to get rid of bacteria, that sort of thing, and they buy boilers to, to heat the milk. So you have a really absurd situation going on where you are running these chillers and they're rejecting heat into the atmosphere and then you're burning gas to fire these boilers to reheat. So we can, so traditionally our business is an, an, a replacement business, so 80% of our business is replacement, and we see customers that come to us and say, we want to replace this chiller with a new chiller, and we could do that, and the new chiller will be more efficient, but it's an incremental improvement in efficiency. But if you replace that chiller with a thermal system, which is also doing the heating, and so if we go back to the example of the milk factory, this milk factory, instead of replacing chiller for chiller, replaces chiller for a thermal system, then this thermal system not only produces the cold water they need, but produces the hot water they need, and they save all the money that they would spend on gas, and they can use that money to finance the incremental cost of this thermal system. And the reason that these in the heating and cooling has grown up in silos is that for the last, let's say, you know, heating has been around for a long time from burning trees, burning coal, that sort of thing. Cooling is a newer technology, maybe 100 years old, but they grew up with certain traditions, right? So you have whole industries which are making machines that make cold water, and you have whole industries which are making machines that make hot water, and then you have all the, the surrounding ecosystem around that, the design engineers, the mechanical contractors that install all that, but we need to change those traditions, and I think the hardest thing about decarbonization sometimes is not the technologies, but changing the traditions of how things are done. The mindset, the, the mindset, thinking, and the yes, planning. Exactly. Because one of the figures you come up with is 400%. That's right. Increase yes. in efficiency. Exactly. That sounds incredible. It is. And do most people believe that? It, not only do they, but well, I don't know if most, the problem is that most people don't know it, right? Like, I think oh. we know it in our own echo chamber of our industry, but we need to make it you know, and I always use this example, if we think about power generation, everybody knows that it's better to produce power with wind and solar than burning fossil fuels. If we think about transportation today, most people understand that the future of transportation is going to be electric. And there's a big public awareness around those two subjects, but when we talk about heating, and heating and cooling, it's not a subject that's very much in the public consciousness yet. And what we're trying to do with our company is increase the level of awareness that we should combine heating and cooling because those technologies exist, and then you can get huge efficiency gains. And these are measurable gains. And in fact, there have been several studies that show that 50% of the world's fossil fuels are used for heating. Right. Lewis, let me pick up on regulation because you are a lawyer as you emphasized a few minutes ago. What about, what is your view picking up on the discussion we've had in several panels already about the need and the imperative for regulation to achieve the kind of things we're discussing here? No, thanks, Nick. Um, I think it's very important. I think we've seen uh, in the past the role that regulation can play in actually incentivizing the development of technology. If you think about things like feed-in tariffs for the solar industry and for the onshore wind industry, um, if you think about the way that major infrastructure projects are enabled by, you know, regulated asset bases and the sort of charges that you can uh, apply. Um, we have a lot of this regulatory technology, if you like, that's been developed in the UK, Australia, the US, elsewhere. 
it's really all available. Um, it has been rolled out and developed for offshore wind as well, the contract for difference methodologies. Um, it's now time to apply those methodologies to some of these large scale decarbonisation technologies such as carbon capture and storage, uh, and also to help enable green hydrogen and the other forms of hydrogen. Um, this, is, this is actually what is happening right now. Um, I know that um, from the outside looking in, it sometimes can be quite frustrating seeing the uh, pace of change or the lack thereof. Um, but right now, for example, in the United Kingdom, um, a huge amount of work is going on to develop these regulatory instruments that will provide the fund flows into carbon capture and storage and into green hydrogen. Um, and we're seeing similar types of instruments being developed in, in Norway, in Denmark, in the Netherlands to essentially enable decarbonisation of industry and the storage of the carbon dioxide you know, underneath the seabed in, in the North Sea. Similar things are happening in America and Australia, but it's the, I think the European and the UK way of doing it um, is the area where I suppose I'm personally involved and that I find particularly interesting. But what about the framing? And we're going through this discussion now on AI very quickly. It's just a barely a year since um, ChatGBT came in and suddenly everyone's talking about AI. Are, are we facing the same potential bombshell from regulation as well? It's going to have to be done. It's going to have to be done much quicker than it is being done at the moment because of the changes. Yeah. Um, well, look, I, I worked on my first carbon capture and storage project back in 2005. Um, it didn't get much beyond the sort of paper stage, if Which you like. Which country was that in? Uh, the United Kingdom. Um, it, was, it was with BP. Um, they were looking at it quite closely back then. Uh, but back then, um, the laws hadn't been put in place to actually enable the injection of the carbon dioxide into the seabed. Um, international conventions had to be modified to enable that to happen, and ultimately there had to be laws developed. So, for example, the Carbon Capture and Storage Directive that was actually put in place by the European Union, um, I think around 2011, came into force and that was replicated in the United Kingdom and in, in certain member states. Those regulations have continued to evolve to the point where it is legal to actually store carbon dioxide. So that's a fundamental basis for carbon capture and storage, if you think about it. The next thing is to actually enable um, these products, or carbon dioxide, to actually be transported across national boundaries. And that is a very, very recent development. So, for example, there's a project where the carbon dioxide emitted in the Netherlands is going to be transported to the Danish territory and injected underneath the seabed into some, um, some aquifers, if you like, that can take, that, can take that um, CO2. So these laws have developed over time. We're now in a position where that is not a barrier anymore. There are other regulatory barriers, but they're more minor. The main thing now, though, is to provide these regulatory incentives, the sort of positive version of regulation where you get money. And this is the, these instruments are, the, are where it's at right now, and these are things that are being developed. Once they're developed, like you saw with um, uh, solar, onshore wind, offshore wind, once they're developed, these contracts will be available to be bid against. So once the model is there, you should see a rapid rise in the deployment of these technologies. Right, Rob, on the financial side, what are you seeing on, when it comes to financing and investment and the impact on the work that you're doing? Happy to take that. So in terms of investing for, for decarbonization within industry, uh, a key point is that we see a major pivot to green financing. So we're seeing a lot of activity, obviously, within the banking sector in terms of setting targets for green financing and following through with significant investment that's happening. We also see now private markets. So uh, debt from uh, financing for debt from private markets as well becoming very significant. Uh, so from, certainly from a North American market, there is money there to support these investments. A part of the challenge or the friction is this, in the system, though, is still connecting uh, the need and the opportunities with that financing. So part of that is the, uh, on, on, with the corporates to be able to better understand what is available and how to position in terms of what their needs are with the kind of uh, financing instruments that would be available. And so it's coming back to also clarifying what is the benefit of that investment, how to measure quantify the impact uh, from those investments. So that's a key part of the story. So it is telling the green story, but objectively with the data to support what that investment will do. At the same time, uh, from the financial side, uh, there's more opportunity 
to further clarify what the criteria are for green financing, to be more specific in terms of what, particularly on carbon, what that impact is as well. So those are key areas. Another point uh, to stress in terms of accelerating uh, decarbonization is in terms of making this uh, financing instruments uh, available in more opportunities to make it more accessible to corporates. And so we see some of that uh, innovation happening now, certainly within solar. If you think about someone investing in solar, there are many different ways that one can have the benefits of solar. Uh, that can be from a direct investment, but there are a variety of um, investment uh, opportunities where a supplier might be integrating financing with that. We see that kind of innovation, that need to expand in terms of other solutions as well. We're beginning so essentially to see you're saying that uh, finance is now becoming much more attractive for decarbonization. It is becoming more attractive, but we see a lot more opportunity yet to even make it more accessible, more, uh, much more accessible for corporates to so take advantage of it. What has to be done? So the innovation, we're, we're seeing it take place in the market. We are seeing that. And... Um, but again, it's keeping pace. And so it's having that focus and providing those new investment tools. I'd say one last piece to focus on, though, in terms of uh, what can be done. In many of the cases, for the kind of opportunities that we see corporates looking to invest in, uh, do rely on market instruments, as I just talked about for renewable electricity, for example. Well, one of the areas that's really important is to make sure that we have the accounting rules for GHG reductions to be able to keep up with the instruments that are available. So if a corporate is looking at uh, different uh, available opportunities, they want to make sure that the investment that they're evaluating is clearly defined within the accounting rules so, so that there is not a risk of that not showing up, and that comes back to financing as well, to have that uh, certainty that that benefit is there. And so that's a key element that we're focused on as well. Thanks, Rob. I'm Alex, just before I come to you, uh, I'll take some questions at uh, any, any point. So, get the, not yet, but get the microphone to you and then you're on standby. Anyone else like to come in on car decarbonization? I can't see any hand going up at the moment, but maybe they will. Alex, what about education? What about what has to be done to make people aware of what has to be done, particularly in um, a country like yours, which is a relatively new arrival um, in the European Union and is, is moving very significantly to modernize in the way you've just highlighted and your president did earlier. But what about um, making people comfortable with what has to be done, as opposed to thinking that somehow the way they've been earning money um, needs to continue, as opposed to the way it needs to change, and they have to change as well? So I think when it comes to education, there are actually two pillars. So there is the pillar of raising awareness, making people aware that climate change is happening and they need to be part of the change. And of course, in Romania, we do that uh, by implementing changes to the uh, school curriculum, for instance, for, to the school curriculum. But then also there is the pillar related to empowering people to be part of the green transition. And that's very much related to skills and skills development. And um, we have set this year as a priority for the Romanian government to align actually the training of young people and um, the But what about the older generation as well? The older generation expect to keep a job. Yes, but we have also programs for skilling and reskilling. So uh, building skills for the new generation and also reskilling um, previous generations or even generations and workers that have been more involved and are more dependent on carbon intensive industries. And in Romania, we have a very successful program which is run uh, by a skilling and reskilling center in Constanza um, on the shore of the Black Sea. So we have there a center which is actually one of the largest centers of skilling uh, in Europe. And they also specialize in reskilling miners. So they have been very successful in the last years in basically training miners from regions of Romania that are more coal dependent and enabling them to be part of the green transition to work as uh, solar photovoltaic installers or to work in the um, offshore wind industry across Europe. Do you think the principle of decarbonizing is by and large accepted now within society, particularly obviously by the next generation? So we, we are looking at, you know, different surveys, actually, um, and we see that at the level, you know, across age groups, there is a recognition that climate change is one of the largest challenges that we are facing this century. 
um, and that we need to do something about it. Now, of course, in terms of the solutions and you know what people understand by decarbonization, if people get asked in Romania, some might say plant more forests, some might say we need to reduce our emissions from transport and so on and so forth. But I would say that there is public acceptance that something needs to be done where we need to work more, and I, I'm not sure, I mean, I think this is something that we need to do across Europe, is to provide people with solutions um, to make it clear um, how they can participate in the green transition. Because I think there is a lot of willingness to be part of the green transition, but no, uh, not everybody, you know, is aware of how they could also at individual level or, you know, through their businesses, contribute to the green transition. Right. Thank you. Okay, let's go to that question, please. Anyone else want yeah. to come in as well? I don't see a hand at the moment. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, so we've heard... Uh, Just tell us who you are. Uh, I'm Oscar Espinosa from Pellet, Mexico. We're developing the bioenergy sector in our country, in Mexico. Uh, we've heard a lot of the carbonization, specifically the carbonization of heat in the industry. And we've heard about electrification, we've heard about hydrogen, but I haven't heard anything around uh, bioenergy, uh, specifically biomass no, and solid biofuels. So what's, what's your take on that? Um, and Jose, you mentioned a thermal system uh, that you were um, deploying. What's the energy source of this system, you know, it's it, uh, and how does it work? I would like to know. Thank you. Thermal, can you come in on that? Yes, so they... a th thermal system is it's an electrically driven system, right? So they're machines that use electricity to create uh, cool and or create heat. And the big efficiency gain comes from not wasting energy, right? And I think this is a, a very key point around the whole decarbonization story, because sometimes people think that the decarbonization journey is going to take a long time because we look at the world through the current lens, right? So, but we have to remember that a decarbonized world will be much less energy intensive than, a, than the world we live in today. So it's not such a big jump, right? So when we sell a thermal system, it's 400% more efficient. So, you know, if we had to produce the heat and cool the current way, producing it the new way, consumes a lot less energy. So it makes it a lot easier to do these things than people really think. Rob, do you want to come in, come in on, on thermal? Actually, if I, I would love to pick up on the point from Jose on, on the opportunities that are available right now. And the, the point that, um, you know, when we think about deep decarbonization for industry, uh, we're talking about carbon capture here, we're talking about hydrogen. That is absolutely necessary and we need to be taking steps right now. At the same time, it's important to keep in mind that some of the opportunities that we have known about for a long time, Jose hit upon it earlier, and certainly with heating and cooling, but there are many opportunities that are immediately available that are affordable and can be deployed right now. And that's across a variety of energy efficiency opportunities that go beyond heating and cooling. And when we work on uh, across uh, North America, but many markets, uh, we see immediate opportunities for payback. Uh, on average, we might be seeing 5 to 15 percent energy reduction with a less than two-year payback from Ooh. immediate opportunities that we're seeing. Uh, examples uh, include going much deeper as well. In, in, in many cases with, with clients that you know, have already been working on energy efficiency, so it's not like they haven't thought about it at all. So there are opportunities. Number two is on renewable electricity. And, um, and certainly, the commercial industrial sector has been a major driver for investment in new renewable electricity uh, facilities, but there is still more opportunity here as well. And so, uh, for a, an industrial to think about how do I start to change things immediately, there are available energy efficiency opportunities, and thinking about going to renewable electricity is immediate, available, and very much affordable. Lewis, can I pick up? It's, uh, this is not because you live in Britain and I come from Britain, um, although you're Australian, truly. Um, uh, we've had a, a blip and a bump in the last few weeks on contracts for wind uh, licenses uh, when Vattenfall gave back their contract because the costs, they couldn't match them. I'm, I'm raising this because it raises a, an important question about the cost of decarbonization. Here you have Jose talking about a 400% efficiency when it comes to um, the systems he was talking about. Yet there's been a bump and a squeak. 
and it's actually meant that a licensing round about a month ago meant no one wanted to show an interest, simply because it's coming too complicated. Is this now a slowing down, potentially, of decarbonisation? No, it's a good point. There's a, probably a couple of bumps in Britain because we've had that and also then the kind of wind back of some of the interim net zero targets in relation to um, you know, um, combustion vehicles, those sorts of things. The thing to remember with all of this is you, you know, you've got to be able to produce a business model as a company that ultimately produces a profit from the investment. Um, you know, we talked about financing earlier. I have mentioned some of these other technologies. You've got to produce a profit over time. Um, and so these models have to work. And the inputs sometimes are not fully known at the time of building up the business model. So you have to make assumptions around inflation, around supply costs, and also around the external factors that are going to come to play in the investment. For example, a carbon price or a carbon border adjustment mechanism, all these things that are being talked about, they factor into these business models. And over time, you've got to see that you have a competitive model that produces a profit. So the issues with the UK um, offshore wind bidding rounds most recently was that the tariff being offered to those who were bidding for the opportunity wasn't adequate to actually cover the costs of putting in place the turbines and every other cost that's involved in building an offshore wind farm. And so, so but the response was quite, Incredible, really. It was quite positive in that the British government said, OK, well, we'll, we'll increase the tariff by 50 per cent. And they did it very quickly. They did it very quickly, but then that, that's how it should work. They're, they're, they're fine-tuning and adjusting. At the end of the day, the public has to pay for all of this. And so they shouldn't overpay. The government shouldn't overpay for these things. But they have to pay just the sort of Goldilocks amount. And that's a fine balance that needs to be determined in each jurisdiction over time for each of these technologies. It's not easy, but it can be done as long as there's good dialogue between the companies and the governments. Alex, when it comes to making new systems and new investments work, how is Romania handling this? Because these are expensive, they require imagination, and they've got to be done pretty quickly. Yes. And I think here, you know, funding, from, from where we are standing, funding is, is not the biggest problem because being an EU country and having also access to funding from multilateral development banks, we feel that for large projects and for green uh, energy projects, there is a lot of funding. But uh, the ability to write and implement projects, that's something that, you know, uh, we, are, we are still struggling with. So that's why from a governmental level, increasing the administrative capacity, uh, it's something that, you know, we are trying to prioritize. And also for large infrastructure projects, again, it's not necessarily the funding, it's also, you know, the workforce and the qualified workforce for these projects that uh, we need to further develop. All right. There's someone, a hand has gone up very quickly. Two hands have gone up, literally when we've got two minutes to run. But go ahead, please. Thank you for sharing. Just make, your, a, make your point. Yes. Thank you for sharing your experience and wisdom. With regards to innovation in, in financing decarbonization, would you be able to reflect upon a situation on the ground, which is when an SME, for example, wants to invest in energy efficiency machines? That energy efficiency, on one hand, will help reduce emissions footprint. But at the same time, there can be trade-offs, whereby they want to also make sure the wastewater quality going out of the factory is better, so they have to invest in wastewater treatment, right. energy goes up. Right. What do you think about trade-offs? What do you think of talking to insurance companies to reduce their insurance premiums when they are doing better on energy That's and pretty water? complicated. Okay, hand that mic, mic across. Oh, you've got, two mic. you've got a mic already. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, v very quickly, uh, Alexander Curry from HSF uh, Riyadh. Would the panel like to comment on the role of nuclear in the energy transition, which we haven't heard so much about? Decarbonisation, we're talking De about. Yeah, yeah, yeah well, okay. the role of okay, nuclear. Okay, very in quickly, you can see we're almost out of time, but um, nuclear. Yeah. Um, I mean, Oliver Stone has just produced a very excellent documentary called Nuclear Now, so it's all in there, actually, if you want to know. I, th I watched that, I agreed with it. Um, it has a big role to play uh, because it doesn't produce any carbon dioxide and it's a readily available large-scale base load power system. Thing is, public fear is very much there, and the politicians need to deal with that. What about SMRs, small modular reactors, Alex? Is that something that could happen so in Romania? Our national decarbonisation plan for uh, 2050 reaching carbon neutrality includes nuclear, 
And indeed, we are uh, working with the United States in uh, deploying one of the first SMRs uh, in uh, the European Union. If not the first one, we will see, you know, what other SMRs enter the race. And the reason is uh, that nuclear is actually, we consider it to be, you know, a stable source of energy. And we think that together with renewables, it could really take us to uh, net zero. We feel that Without nuclear, we are going to have to rely too much on CCUS, and that might not be, you know, fully feasible. Um, and also, Romania okay. has a good experience with nuclear because we do have uh, a nuclear power plant, and there is public acceptance for nuclear in Romania. Okay, uh, that other ra quite quite detailed question, Jose, can you pick it up at all? Which one? Uh, the from the gentleman. I, are you where, where are you from? I'm based in Hong Kong. We typically work with factories, evaluate their implementations. Yeah, yeah I think uh, what you said was quite correct, and we as an industry need to keep making sure that we link all the players, whether they're people that are designing systems, insuring systems, insuring savings, together to show them what is available today so that we can scale these technologies faster. Rob? I'd say that... Um the movement toward better quantifying uh, climate risk, other environmental risks, and building that into management systems is enabling, as, as financial sector is looking at lending, uh, all of this supports the, the green financing, right? So it is you know, supporting the, the benefit of, of the green financing. The challenge there is we're still very much focused on the silos that we talked about earlier. In this case, the silo of climate, the silo of um, you know, other sustainability factors, but integrating that into a, a more complete view, I think, is the opportunity we're working toward. It is not there today. We'll be talking about decarbonizing for years to come because the scale is so enormous, whichever way you look at it, whether you're from the north, south, east, or west. So thank all four of you to, for being here, and thanks for giving us your perspective. I'm gonna, just going to say goodbye to everyone before you leave the stage. That's the end of today. I'm afraid the mayor of Freetown hasn't been able to join us. Uh, she's um, stuck somewhere else. And so uh, we've, we're ending about 10 minutes early. But it does mean you can go to the drinks, which are taking place on the island of Hope, um, shortly. So thank you very much indeed for being with us today. We will start at 9.30 tomorrow morning. You are now registered, so there won't be the queue. Um, so please, if you'd like to, get here on time, and we'll uh, reward you with excellent content. So thank you very much for joining us today.